Today we're in Luke 1, verses 26 through 45. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have not had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside me. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Neartown Church. Good morning to all our visitors here. My name is Jake Porter. I'm one of the mission partners here at Neartown, and I get to be on the teaching team and uh, really excited to share <clears throat> with you this morning. So um, Russell and I were talking about what we were going to do for, for this Christmas season, and I threw out this idea uh, of of talking about the Christmas story from different perspectives of different characters in the story. And he, and he said, well, is there one you want to do? And I said, Mary. And he said, why? I said, cause I've already preached it. <laughs> cause I already had that sermon. I, I preached it a few years ago. And, um, and, uh, then I went back to look, it was 11 years ago. And I, I was thinking about how much has changed in the last 11 years since I preached a version of this text uh, one thing that has changed is that instead of 11-point font, this is 14-point font uh, in my manuscript. So that's that's a change. Uh, 11 years ago, I was still pastoring full-time. Uh, I was not married. I had no kids. Um, uh, it, was, it was a very, very different time in life. And as I reflected on the various changes that have happened, so many of them were completely unexpected. Like like 11 years ago, if you had said, tell me what you'll be doing, (laughs) December of 2024, I'd have never come up with this. And it's not just because you know, I've had some new ideas and changed my mind about this or that. A lot of it has been um, interruptions to my life. Things that were outside of my control, things that were unexpected, things that have, at least at the moment, seemed to intrude. Have you ever had your life interrupted? By something, something unexpected. Now, sometimes this is good news, right? Sometimes it's it's a surprise promotion or a friend you haven't heard from in a long time reaches out or some other unforeseen blessing. Other times it's it's something unsettling. It's a diagnosis. It's a loss. It's an unexpected challenge. It's um, the outing of something you thought was hidden. Whether painful or joyful, these interruptions redefine us, don't they? 
they force us to stop, to recalibrate, and, and to see life differently. And so this morning, we're kicking off our Christmas series here at Neartown Church, in which we're going to consider the birth of Jesus, the story of Jesus' birth, from the perspective of several different story uh, uh, characters, key characters that were a part of the event. And um, it really begins with a major interruption. A young girl living in a small, forgettable town is greeted by an angel. Bless you. Imagine Mary. You know, she, she, no doubt, I have no doubt, Mary had plans for her life, simple as they may have been. We know she was at that time already engaged to this man named Joseph. She was preparing for the life of a wife and mother, probably by all means content to live in quiet obscurity. But then God stepped in with news that would change everything, not just for Mary, but for the entire world through her. And in the first chapter of Luke, we see Mary chosen by God to carry this very special baby who would be the Messiah, the promised one. The weight of this calling is enormous. Yet, instead of fear or resistance, Mary responds in this really remarkable way. As we heard Kristen read, may it be unto me. And then we eventually get from her another response that I just think is fascinating. We get a song. Kristen read right up to the song in the story. It's a song of joy, of praise. It's deeply theological in its reflection. Mary's song is traditionally called the Magnificat. And it reveals to us the heart of Christmas through the eyes of the woman who literally gave birth to the Christmas story. It's about God's grace, a grace that transforms individuals and and it really just upends the world as we know it. It's about God's kingdom, a kingdom that absolutely defies expectations and overturns the values of this world. And so today we're going to look at Mary's song, which is there in Luke chapter one, verses 46 through 55. So if you've got your Bible or your Bible app, open up there, Luke one, starting in verse 46. We're going to going to kind of refer back to some earlier verses as well and some later verses as well. But that's, that's our primary text there, Luke 1, 46 through 55. And, and so as, as we heard from what Kristen read, after Mary learns from the, uh, the angel that she's going to be carrying this child, she goes on a trip to visit Elizabeth. And a little bit of the backstory is Elizabeth was much older, had been barren, and this is her cousin. This is Mary's cousin, Elizabeth. And she had also been visited by an angel and told she was going to bear a child. And so Elizabeth is pregnant at the time that Mary goes to visit her. And Elizabeth's child is going to be John the Baptist, okay, if you're familiar with, with him. And so and so this miracle has happened in these two women's stories. Now, why, why does Mary go visit Elizabeth? There's probably a lot of reasons why, but one of the reasons is she's an unwed pregnant woman. And she's probably getting out of town. And I, I imagine, I can't help but imagine the frame of mind she's in as she goes on this journey to visit Elizabeth. And, 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 I, I, and this is my sanctified imagination. This is not in the text, but I can't imagine except that there's a mixture of like, like wonder and awe and joy, but also like fear, anxiety, dread, right? Like what's going to happen? Maybe even shame, you know, who knows? She walks in with, to, to, to Elizabeth's home, 
And it says that the baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt with joy at the sound of her voice. Filled with the Holy Spirit, the baby filled with the Holy Spirit, recognizing what's what's happening. And, And this is a sign, I think, of such assurance to Mary that in response, she sang. She opens her mouth, and I'm sure, inspired by the Holy Spirit, sings these songs. And through her words, what we'll see, and this is the main point of the message today, is that Christmas reveals the surprising grace of God's revolutionary kingdom. The grace of God, if you think you've got it figured out, you don't. It's surprising. If you think God's kingdom is just like a bigger, better version of this world's, that's wrong. It's totally revolutionary. It's totally backwards. And that's what we see. This is a kingdom where the humble are lifted up, where the proud are brought low, and where God's promises are fulfilled in the most unexpected ways. So let's step into Mary's experience and allow her song to shape how we see the grace and the kingdom of God this Christmas season. So we're going to begin by stepping into Mary's story as she sings the opening lines of the song. Look at verse 46 with me in Luke 1. She sings, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Now, I've I've already reminded you of her situation, right? But again, let let me point out a few things that I didn't earlier. By all estimations, Mary, this young betrothed girl, was likely in her early teens. Now to us, in our culture, our society, that hits us one way. It's very different in that culture and society. So if you can try to remove your judgment about that and just think about develop, just think about a young teen girl developmentally. Like, this is this is quite a weight. This is quite a burden to put on someone who in that world would just be considered, you know, a a character of, of insignificance. She lived in Nazareth, a small town of ill repute. She had no wealth. She had no status. She had no influence. She wasn't someone the world would have noticed. But God did. God noticed her. And what we see here is that God's surprising grace lifts up the humble. When Gabriel greets her with greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. It says Mary, back in verses 28 and 29, was greatly troubled. Now, why? Why would she be favored by God in the first place? Well, the angel explains. Verse 30 says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. That word favor there, it's the word grace. You found grace with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. And here's what's remarkable. This favor or this grace, it wasn't something Mary earned. That's not grace. You can't earn grace by definition. The angel doesn't tell her, listen, God has chosen you because you're extraordinary, Mary. He didn't say that. Or he didn't say, God's chosen you because you are so righteous, Mary. You are more qualified, Mary, than anyone else. No. God's put his grace on you. He's chosen to set his favor on you. It's unmerited favor, pure grace, given simply because he chose her. And Mary understood this. And that's why her song begins with magnifying God. 
and not herself. Her joy wasn't in what she had done, but in what God had done and was doing in her. In verse 48, she reflects on what she calls her humble estate. She acknowledges her lowliness, her insignificance in the eyes of the world. Yet she rejoices because God looked on her. And this phrase, looked on, is a, is a very um, rich phrase with Old Testament meaning. And, and Mary, it does seem, she knew her Bible. She knew her Hebrew Bible, her Old Testament scriptures, because she quotes so many. She draws so many allusions in this song. And so this phrase looked on in the Old Testament, when, when God looks on someone, it's a sign of his blessing and his favor. It's not just, oh, his eyes happen across them. It's not just that he notices them. It's that he acts in love and mercy as he sets his gaze upon them. Now, think about what this tells us about the kingdom that God intends to establish through the birth of this child. In a world that values power and wealth and influence, God chose the humble. He doesn't operate by our human standards. Mary's song shows us that God's kingdom elevates those who are so often overlooked in this world, those who have nothing to offer except their faith and their willingness to trust in him. And what does Mary say will happen because of this grace? Look at verse 48. She says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Her blessing doesn't come from her accomplishments or her status. It comes entirely from God's mighty act of grace in her life. And she goes on to say, he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. Again, notice the focus, not on her worth, but God's greatness. Now, let's turn our attention here to ourselves, bring it closer to home. I want, you know, sometimes preachers ask questions and you kind of nod and you hear the question. I want you to just truly like make a little bit of space in your heart for this question I'm about to ask you. How often do you feel unworthy of God's attention? Um, here's how it goes in my mind. <laughs> it's, it's, I feel silly even saying it out loud, so I feel like I have to qualify it. Like, I know what I'm about to say is absolutely ridiculous theologically, but I'm just being real with you. This is a story in my mind. There are so many other people with so many other problems that are so much bigger and worse than mine. Why should I be looking for that help, that grace, that favor? Why should I be expecting that answered prayer? So how about you? What's the story in your mind? How often do you feel unworthy for whatever reason of God's attention? Perhaps you think, I'm too ordinary. Perhaps you think, I've messed up. I've messed up too much for God to notice me, for God to look upon me. Mary's story is a reminder that God doesn't choose us because of what we can bring to the table. He chooses us because of his grace. The kingdom of God is not about climbing ladders to impress him. It's about him reaching down in love and lifting us up. And here's the beauty. Mary's experience is not unique to her. I mean, yes, she's the only one that will be con you know, conceived by the Holy Spirit and give birth to the Messiah. But not unique in this dynamic of God's grace. Scripture tells us again and again that God's grace is for the humble, 
the downtrodden, the lowly. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Isaiah 57, 15 tells us, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Listen to what this holy God says. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. And so what does this mean for us? It means we can come to God as we are, broken, weak, lowly, unimpressive, and he will meet us with grace. It means we don't have to earn his favor because it's freely given. And it means that no matter how insignificant we feel, God sees us. He looks on us with love. I've experienced this myself so many times in my own failure, in my own weakness, and what by the world's standards would be absolute disqualification from everything I do in my life. This Christmas, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, let's remember that it begins with a humble girl in a humble town. And let's ask ourselves, how can we, from a place of our own humility, magnify God in our lives just as Mary did? How can we rejoice in his grace, knowing that he lifts up the lowly and brings us into his revolutionary kingdom? Mary's song doesn't stop with her personal experience. So after reflecting on how God's grace has lifted her up, she shifts her focus to the larger picture of what God's doing in the world. Listen to what she says in verse 50. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. This part of the song is a celebration of how God's kingdom confronts and overturns human pride. It's the flip side of humility. Mary is describing a complete reversal of the values that the world holds dear. Not only does God's grace surprise us by lifting up the humble, but also turning everything about how the world works on its head. Those who are proud in their hearts, who rely on their own strength or wealth or position or smarts or, you know, good looks or whatever it is, they are brought low. God's surprising grace brings down the prideful. So let's unpack this. Notice first the language Mary uses in verse 51. She says, he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Pride begins in the heart. In the heart. In the way that we think about ourselves. It's, it's, it's not, oh, I'm good at this. Okay, I, there are things I know I'm good at. That's, that's not it. It's the belief that we're self-sufficient. That we don't need God. And you might go, well, of course I need God. That we don't need God as much as we really do that we can secure our lives by our own power, or maybe we can get 80, 85% there and just need him to close the gap. This kind of pride isn't just a personal issue. It's, it's a societal one. It's the foundation of systems that, that can elevate the powerful and suppress the powerless. But Mary tells us that God doesn't leave pride unchallenged. She says, he has shown strength with his arm. And here's another vivid image of, of God's active intervention in history from the Old Testament. Throughout scripture, God's arm is a symbol of his power to save and to deliver. 
So think back to Exodus, right? When when God delivered his people from Pharaoh's oppression, or you can even think of Jesus' ministry where he heals the sick and he fed the hungry and he forgave sinners, all acts that confronted human pride and showed the strength of God's kingdom. Mary's song isn't just theoretical. It's rooted in her lived experience. Consider what happens in the events surrounding Jesus' birth. When Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem, there's no room for them in the inn, right? So the savior of the world is born in a stable, a place for animals. It's so, it's just so easy because so many of us have heard this story so many times to not really reflect on what what happens here. The savior of the world is born in a stable for animals. His first visitors are shepherds, which were men of the absolute lowest rung of society. And yet the angels appear to them, to those shepherds, with the announcement, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among those with whom he's pleased. Do you see the pattern? At every turn here, God is flipping human expectations. A king is born, but not in a palace. Good news is proclaimed, but not to the powerful, not to the religious elite. The kingdom of God is advancing, but not in the way that anyone would expect. But God's kingdom doesn't just confront pride. It also offers mercy to those who fear him. Verse 50 says, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. To fear God, what does that mean? It's to recognize our dependence on him, to stand in awe of his holiness to stand in all of his righteousness, which means we recognize our need for his grace. It's the opposite of pride. It's a heart posture that says, I need you. So what does this mean for us today? It it means we need to examine our hearts again. Where are we holding on to pride? Where are you relying on your own strength? Where are you relying on your own status or your resources instead of God? Where do we go along with the world's ways of oppression, of celebrating pride and disposing of meekness? And you know, I I am so guilty This Christmas, as we reflect on on this story and and Mary's song, let's allow it to challenge us. Let's ask God to, to scatter the pride of our own hearts, to replace it with humility. Let's commit to living as citizens of his kingdom where the hungry are filled, where the lowly are exalted, and his mercy extends to all who fear him. Now, Mary's song concludes with a focus on God's faithfulness. Listen to her words, starting verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Here, Mary reflects on how God's grace to her is part of a much larger story. The grace she experienced isn't just about her. It's about God fulfilling his promise to his people. It's about God's kingdom advancing through his covenant faithfulness. It's so easy to, even when we recognize God's grace, to think that he's giving us the grace for us, for our lives, for what we're doing, and to see it like terminating right here on us. And you are missing it if that's how you see it. If God's showing you grace, he is sweeping you up into something so much bigger To understand the depth of what Mary's saying here, we need to step back. I'm 
very briefly into the history of God's people long, long before Mary's time, God made a covenant with a man named Abraham promising to bless him and his descendants and to make them a blessing to all the nations. That's back in Genesis 12. And through Abraham's lineage, God promised to bring salvation to the world. This covenant was renewed through Moses and then through David and then the prophets reinforced it, each time pointing toward this promised one, this Messiah, this Savior who would come and establish God's kingdom. And for centuries, for centuries, the people of God waited. They endured slavery and exile and oppression. And though they did not do it perfectly, they did somehow, by God's grace, they clung to God's promises. Even when the plan seemed so distant and so unclear. And now, in Mary's womb, That plan is being fulfilled literally in the flesh. The Messiah has come. God has, in fact, remembered his mercy. You see, God's surprising grace allows us to participate in his plan. God's grace is not about you accomplishing your plan. That's just, that's so small. Don't think so small. The story of Christmas shows us that by his mercy, the unexpected, the lowly and the humble are chosen to be a part of this much larger story that God has been unfolding since the very beginning. Christmas makes it clear that in ways beyond what we can conceive or imagine, God is at work for our good and his glory. Notice how Mary's song emphasizes God's remembrance of his promises. Verse 54, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. God's mercy isn't an afterthought. It is woven into the very fabric of his kingdom. Mary's experience of grace is an outworking of a promise that stretched back generations. We see this faithfulness echoed later in the Christmas story as well. When Mary, you know, it's just another one of these things. Put yourself in Mary's shoes if you can for a minute, okay? Like angel comes, oh, okay. Pregnancy, you go visit Elizabeth, reconnect with Joseph. You're gonna have this, you know, gotta go to Nazareth because of the census, gonna have this baby, no room in the inn, right? This baby shows up, shepherds show up. I mean, this is crazy, right? Here's what I think happens. Then Mary and Joseph are gonna bring the infant Jesus into the temple. And this is the custom. Like, this is what was done. After so many days, that you know, a newborn baby is brought to the temple. And so, like, Normal. I I wonder if Mary's like, okay, now we get to be a normal family for a while. Okay. They walk into the temple with Jesus and they meet Simon. And Simon is an elderly man who's been waiting. He has been waiting for the Messiah. Okay. And everybody thinks the Messiah is going to be this military conqueror. It's going to come and throw off the bonds of the Romans and all this. Luke 2, 25 tells us, Simon was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And when he sees this infant, he runs over and he scoops this baby into his arms and he praises God and he says, my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples. Simon's words affirm what Mary already knew. God's promises are being fulfilled in this baby. This baby, Jesus. Simon's blessing also contained this sobering truth. He tells Mary that her child, verse 34, is, listen, 
appointed for the falling and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And he adds, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Mary's joy is intertwined with the reality that God's kingdom comes at a cost. The same grace that brings salvation will also bring division. The Savior who fulfills God's promises will suffer and will die. And she's going to watch it happen. And this is the tension of the Christmas story. God's faithfulness doesn't always look like we expect. His kingdom doesn't advance without challenge or sacrifice. And yet, as Mary's song reminds us, God is always faithful. He always keeps his promises, even at great cost to himself, even if it cost him his own son. This baby boy born in the stable of animals without pomp or circumstance was the one in whom every promise of God would be yes and amen. The savior of the world slipping into this world in silence, almost sneaky in a way. And he would be raised by Mary and Joseph for the next three decades until he would be hung on a cross executed for claiming to be the God who can, who can forgive sins and make people new. He, the righteous one, died in our place so that we sinners could be found righteous in him. For us today, this is a profound promise. Just as Mary saw God's faithfulness in her life, so we can trust that in our own. We may not always understand his timing or his ways, but we can rest assured in the knowledge that his mercy is sure and his kingdom will prevail because Jesus not only died, but he rose again. So think about your own life. Are there promises of God that you're waiting to see fulfilled? Maybe you're holding on to the promise to give you peace in the midst of anxiety. Maybe you're trusting him to work redemption in a broken relationship. Or maybe you're just longing for a day when the pain and suffering will end and all things will be made new. Mary's song, really this story of Christmas, invites us to anchor our hope in God's faithfulness found in Jesus. Just as he remembered his mercy to Israel, he remembers his mercy to us. Just as he fulfilled his promise through Jesus, he will fulfill every promise he has made to his people. And it starts with Jesus. In him, through him, to him, all things. This Christmas, let's join Mary in magnifying the Lord for his faithfulness. Celebrate that the grace of God's kingdom is not only surprising and revolutionary, but also steadfast and sure. And let's live as people who trust that God's promises are always worth living. And here's my call to action for you. And I, I hope that you'll like grab these questions, grab this next slide, this call to action here, take a picture of it, whatever, and just spend maybe one day on question one, question two, question three, three different days, like 10 to 15 minutes. Where am I proud? Where where are the, the pockets of my own life where I trust my own sufficiency? Where I'm relying on my own strength? Just ask God to, to show those, those areas to you. And... And just seek to be humble, to acknowledge to God, like that could all be gone in a moment. Oh, I'm such a hard worker. Guess what? I promise you there's someone on this earth who works harder than you and doesn't have it as good as you have. Where am I humble? Where am I waiting on God? Where am I relying on him? And ask God to give you the patience to remain in that place 
of waiting and openness and humility. And where do I doubt? Where do I doubt that he's working in my life in a way bigger than I can see? Not a plan of my life, but his plan for his kingdom. And can you just be expectant? Can you, can you ask him to open your eyes to see the evidence all around that he's working something so much bigger? In a moment, we're going to have this time of reflection and we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And honestly, I forgot we we're taking the Lord's Supper when I wrote this sermon. But it's a perfect, it's perfect ending. What's more humble than simple bread and juice? I mean, this is what we feed babies, right? Kids with no teeth, there's gum on the, you know. And this is God's chosen way of proclaiming Christ's death until he comes again. A broken body, shed blood. That's the path to victory. May we take up our cross and follow that path with him. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for your word. And I just ask you, Lord, as we enter into this Christmas season that you would be at work within us in a way that would extend blessing far beyond our lives and all the way into, you know, the lives of those with whom we live, work, and play all the way around the world, Lord. It's amazing that we get to be a part of your kingdom. I pray here uh, that, that here this morning, anyone who has not crossed that line of faith and trusted in Jesus, that you even right now would be calling them to yourself, calling them to just surrender and to say, I need, I need Jesus. I need him. Do this great work, Lord, for the good of your people and the glory of your name, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.